Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Open Source in Business. Uh, this is a, a series where we've explored the aspects of the ways that open source influences industry way beyond uh, sort of the narrow lens of open source product startups. And this week, we're talking about open source as it pertains to standards organizations. And we're joined by uh, Stephen Wally, who will be hosting this episode, Salona Bonewald from IEEE SA, and Guy Martin from Oasis. And I will uh, be handing off to Stephen right about now. Perfect. Thanks, Dave. So as Dave said, uh, this is a discussion about you know the business of standards and open source. And we've seen this kind of rising tide in, in the discussion for the last few years as standards organizations represented by yourselves have started to step into this world of how do we support open source projects. And at the same time, we've seen a lot of open source nonprofits start to figure out how do we do specifications and standards. And so I think this is a, a fabulous discussion as these worlds start coming together. Um, I've been excited by it because I built standards. I, I helped work on the POSIX standard 30 years ago. And it, it's so it's, and that's something people still talk about POSIX operating systems. So it's interesting to see how that has evolved into this kind of open source world. Uh, but I would love to hear from each of you, if you could each take a few minutes to introduce yourselves and talk about how your organization is stepping into this space, uh, you know, very much as the IEEE is one of the premier standards building organizations and has been for decades and decades now. Uh, Oasis came on stream 20 years ago now and has been successfully building specifications in the space for a long time. So uh, Salona, could you go first and tell us what you do? <laughs> oh, okay, so I'm the ED of IEEE SA Open, which is um, a platform, but it's also a community. And what we're doing is we're supporting open source and standards and within the IEEE in general. And so it's more about creating a atmosphere or community where we can go in and do that. One thing that's really interesting in regards to having it underneath standards instead of the regular is uh, its longevity. Um, because of the fact that we're committing to standards, we kind of went about creating our platform a different way than most would, since we wanted it to be there for the next you know, 30 plus years or 100 years or 130 years or you know, however long things end up being in existence. Sorry, I was grabbing the 30 from your um, positive example. Uh, <clears throat> but for a lot of it, it really is an expansion of things. It's not a replacement. And so it's all about adding in all these new capabilities and features and everything to make us better at it. Uh, we don't feel that like every single standard will suddenly become open source. Um, but we do want to make sure that we can support all of the different ones who do want to who do want that path. And so we're doing a lot of different stuff in regards to that. And we're looking at it not just from a perspective of documentation or things of that nature, but from the perspective of an entire community. And I think that's the big lesson that open source has to teach is that it isn't just about, a, you know, creating that piece of paper or that standard, it's about creating an, an entire community that continuously keeps growing. And I think IEEE being so volunteer led, it's already got that baked in. And so they're very friendly towards going forward in regards to that. Super, thanks, Solana. Guy, how, your, your world's gotta look the same, but different. I, it does, and and you know, Sloan and I are are, are uh, colleagues and friends, and we're we're often you know very aligned on things like community, and and so I would echo everything she said about building community. You know, Oasis has been around as you as you pointed out uh, quite a while, and you know, some may not know us as well, but there are standards that you use every day. Uh, common alerting protocol. If you get a uh, an alert, you know, for an Amber Alert or Weather Alert that's using the CAP protocol that was developed here, uh, open document format, MQTT. So there's there's been a lot of, of stuff that we've done around standards. And, you know, it's interesting because uh, we've only had our open our open source projects, what we call open projects for a couple of years. Uh, and I've been here a year, so it predates me. But, you know, Oasis has been incubating kind of code first projects that spawn standards and open document is a great example, but also spec first things that spawn code and MQTT and SAML are, are great examples. So, you know, I think that that we're really about it. What I'm really about here is, is bringing the best of open source to standards and figuring out how these communities 
as Solana pointed out, had these communities really come together and and do some interesting things. And you know, I I, I had a, a spot in my career where I worked at uh, Samsung, and and we were we had an opportunity to build something um, with Intel, several things with Intel. But one of those was the OIC or Open Connectivity Framework. Um, you know, a thin layer uh, above uh, uh, the uh, IoT uh, wireless space. And uh, that was with a standard, had a standards piece and had an open source piece. So that was really my first experience with that. And I saw some great things that happened there when both communities kind of came together and said, hey, you know, we, we do want longevity, we do want interoperability, but we also want innovation. And so that's, I think, what I'm trying to bring to Oasis is that is that that hybrid mix of, of open source and standards. So is this a situation where we're talking reference implement implementations. Like, is this something where it's it's really about okay, we're working on we we know we're defining a space. We know we have to capture a specification of some kind, whether it's an interface or a protocol or something. But we're building code at the same time, or is this more about some kind of phased approach of a spec or code first, and then the other thing happens? I think you know, it how, doesn't have linked. It doesn't have to be, it's not an either or, right? I think that it happens, there are some that happen code first, right? MQTT uh, or is a great example, and there's some that happen spec first. And so I think, you know, what we've been trying to do is provide an environment very similar to what Solana and IEEE are trying to do, provide an environment where you can have a project come in and if they want to start as an open source project, baseline protocol uh, at Oasis, a great example, real quick, baseline is a, a, a DLT agnostic way of verifying private transactions with data on the uh, on the public uh, Ethereum mainnet that doesn't leave private data there. And they've done a great job of coming in and building an open source effort and then taking their API and using that as the bones of their specification. And it's kind of funny, I was talking to Chris Ferris from IBM yesterday uh, on my Open Matters, a couple of days ago on my Open Matters podcast, and he really brought this to the forefront of, hey, let's figure out kind of what things look like in code and he's a big proponent of that. Let's figure out what things look like in code and then figure out how we take the API, you know, that, that we're defining, hollow it out, you know, uh, make it a standard so that we can do more performant implementation. So I don't think it's reference implementations in that sense, Stephen, where, you know, it's the, the, the goal is just to write something that may or may not be used. It's write that, bring something to standards and then let other, let other things, you know, germinate in terms of, of, of other implementations. Right. Okay. Yeah. Solana. <laughs> And on the IEEE side, uh, similarly, we're just trying to support everything, honestly. So we've got a wide variety of stuff that's been going on. Like we have 16 different standards that have been doing different materials on the platform. And it's everything from normative to um, open data to open, open data in regards to either training sets or testing result sets or open hardware specifications or things of that nature. Um, it's all one of those things where that's one reason why we're making it open to everyone, because um, we don't want to limit what later on people can um, start to reference in the standards group. And that's kind of one of the things that end up being one of the impetuses to expand its scope. Um, and of course, bringing me on. <laughs> um, and so for a lot of that, we, we have different groups who are like, oh, are you interested in maybe someday becoming a standard or someday becoming something in regards to that? And so we let everyone basically be on the platform that does that is willing to follow IEEE's rules because we're a 501c3 and um, is, uh, you know, and especially things that are humanitarian in focus. And then also things that are wanting to, you know, uh, start to become a standard or integrate with the standard or things of that nature. Um, so we're, we've kind of created this whole centralization spot for everyone to be able to come and do what it is that they need to do. Okay. So I guess the, the IETF, you know, back in the early nineties, there was the, the, their, their statement about, you know, rough consensus and running code. running code. But that was the context of that statement when it was when it was first coined wasn't open source. The context of that was to become a full use IETF standard, a full use Internet standard. You needed two genetically different implementations. And so that was the running code aspect of it. And in those days, it was a lot of networking companies. You know, you'd have the bake off where you try and, and you know, kind of have a plug fest of implementations to test the protocol. And that was your, your final test that really we've written down a protocol that really can be implemented and we've proven it can be implemented more than once kind of thing and they can communicate. So, you know, when you step into this space, is, is that still a thing? Now, you know, if you only have one open source licensed implementation, 
it really is kind of a reference implementation, right? Like how, how do these world how have these worlds evolved? It's not really making sense. Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think I think we're thinking on it a little bit. Um, so I think that's one reason why we're letting ours be as open as it needs to be, so that if multiples happen, then that's fine. Um, if only a single one happens, that's also fine. We're not trying to be very restrictive on it, and we still let the standards group determine what is necessary for them, you know, going through a bunch of the different processes that we already have in place. Um, but I feel like we're not that restrictive in regards to it. Yeah. Uh, and I think, and Guy, of course, can answer the same, but I think it's similar. Yeah, it's, it's very similar, right? I mean, it's, it's about choice, right? And we say this all the time. It's really about the choice that the community makes and, and the maturity that the, uh, Chris Ferris talked about it again the, the other day about the maturity of that community. Is, is the community ready to go beyond and, and do a standard? And you're right, Stephen, sometimes there there are there is only one implementation of, of that at, at any point in time. But again, I think it's the option and the choice. And um, there's also another element of this, which you know sounds like a little bit of a checkbox, and so I apologize for that. But you know, highly regulated procurement pipelines, government, great example. You know, it's not a love, checkbox. That's important. It's <laughs> important. Well, it's a checkbox in the sense that you know, uh, procurement officers, and so you know, Stephen and Sloan as well. But I'll tell the audience, I, I did DoD consulting for about four and a half years, and uh, in that time, I saw some interesting things and some very, very weird things. And and one of the weird things was that the procurement pipeline for that is really biased towards standards and there's been a lot more open source that comes in and so having that checkbox i mean yes i i think having the ability to do other implementations is fantastic it's the choice element but having that that sort of um uh way of looking at governance right where you can say okay if something if something went through the process to become a standard there was a certain amount of governance you know very open and very um strong governance involved that you can sort of trust and so i think that you know uh the the one of the other things that Chris and I talked about was these perceptions that the open source community has of the standards world and the standards world has of the open source world. And I think one of the things that I like to think about there is that, you know, both sides have merit, but they have to think about what the other side's really about, right? On the standard side, they sometimes look at open source and go, oh, Wild West, no governance, crazy. I mean, we know that's not true, but to get a, st to get a standard and, and then go through that process and have a government procurement officer go, okay, yeah, Okay, there, there's there. I can trust what that governance is. So there, there is something to that. Right. Yeah, well, I see that a lot. I talk, I talk about it. It's basically, I feel like we're going through a Reese's peanut butter cup moment, <laughs> where <laughs> you know, chocolate and peanut butter are great, but together they're even better. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of the perception I have of a lot of it. In that, like sometimes standards needs to loosen up a little bit, needs to get some more implementations, all those kind of things going on. And open source needs a little bit of the maturity level rising here in regards to it. And I have to admit, that's probably the biggest response I get from a lot of entities is, you know, that long tail in regards to um, open source adoption. A bunch of those like the military and, and government and academia and things of that nature are all going, oh, right. So, so it's going to be safe if we get it off of your platform um, is huge. You know, it's, it's it's a very big thing to them to sit there and know that those things are going to be safer because they do have all these compliance issues. They do have all of these different, those check marks that Guy was talking about. And I, I'm also getting that from corporate too, you know? I mean, admittedly right now from the big corporate, not as much from the little corporate, but for a lot of them, they're like, oh, okay, so you're gonna make sure that we don't screw up on legal or licensing or, you know, all of those different implementations. And we're like, yes, you know, we're basically kind of required to do this because we're 501c3 and we have more requirements than anyone else does, honestly, than like the C6s and such. And so we really have to like keep our nose clean in regards to antitrust issues and things of that nature. So we're very cautious, which sometimes means maybe a few rule, more rules than you would have being on GitHub. <laughs> and so sure. sometimes I'm like, maybe you want to stay on GitHub and like move over when you're when you're ready for the rules. But, you know, it's all good. It's all good. Well, but at the same time, I mean, the, the nonprofits in the open source space, uh, if if you're a, certainly the 501c6s are member bound organizations, mm -hmm. the antitrust rules are part of that framework that enable those collaborative discussions without without collaboration turning in, into collusion. You know, it, yeah, it, it's exactly all, all, yep. and all the bad things that that implies. But I, I think there's that. We went when we were building the POSIX standards, 
there was very much a, a one piece of the, the main interface. There was you know 60 engineers in a room for a week per quarter. It took probably three years to get to a document that they would then put out to ballot. And it was balloted by you know, the membership of the IEEE Standards Association at that point, it, you know, anybody with an interest in that technology area. So you went from, you know, a little under a hundred to literally thousands of balloters commenting on the document. So at the end of it, you you had some confidence that this document represented an, an industry consensus on things. And and we were lucky. I, certainly the one piece that I had the most e efforts on uh, Susan Corwin was the engineer from Intel at the front of the room, running this this kind of contentious room of of engineers, always reminding us that we were here as individuals, but ensuring that that group came to strong consensus, stronger than we needed in ballot, because at the end of the day, if we couldn't agree on this document before it went into ballot, there was no way that the ballot would succeed, kind of thing in terms of the percentages to pass it. But that kind of rigor means we have a stake in the ground for a specification that has you know, evolved over 30 years. The idea that I, I've seen people start to make claims of, oh, we can do specifications too and get them into ISO in six months. No, <laughs> that's terrifying to me. Yeah. The idea that, oh, well, there's an ISO standard for it because, but the idea that was hurled together by a group of engineers that don't have the long view is like okay so what's the value of a standard then like that right. so how do you guys balance that on a daily basis wow you know and I, i'm just reading the chat where dave put in the thing that simon phipps wrote and and the the talk that we hear sometimes from the open from open source engineers and engineers in general is like oh, god make a standard right oh, I make a standard it's going to take forever right and i think that this is again that good balancing point of figuring out how you build the bones of that standard. And, and I, I come back to the baseline example again, right? Is okay, we've defined the API, right? We've had to define that to get what we're doing. You've now got something that you can use as, as the bones of that standard. And yeah, maybe it's going to take a little bit more discussion. It's it's certainly, I agree with you, Stephen, trying to do an ISO standard in six months. Yeah, that, that worries me, right? I think, it, I think there needs to be some amount of I don't want to say caution there, but but just you know, making sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed when it comes to the standard. But it doesn't have to be a big long slog. And I think we're seeing more and more of, of, of these efforts where, again, yeah, taking the API, using that as the bones of the standard, then gives you, for me, that gives the two communities something to talk about, right? And gives the two communities right. something to come come to to an agreement on, as opposed to saying, I think some in the open source world, and I thought this for a long time, looked at standards and said, oh gosh, you got we all got in a room and tried to figure out every edge case and every use case a, a priori and make that happen, right? And and that's very very difficult to do, as you pointed out. So you know, being able to say, hey, this is this came from the code and. Hey, there's there's an opportunity for us to work together. Um, to me, that's one of the ways to balance it. And and sometimes that doesn't always work, right? Sometimes there may be an idea or a protocol where you've got to start from the the spec side first. But I I really think and, and Oasis was doing this long before we had our open projects program, right? You had standards where people said, wait a minute. Yeah, okay, I understand that, but we've got to have something in an implementation to actually prove that out, or we've got to find an, find this edge case. And so, you know, like I said, running code. Rough consensus and running code. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one of the things that I, I see when I when I hear that in regards to make a standard, what do we need a standard for? We have code that defines behavior. I also think of another thing that happens in open source a lot, which is user interface design. Why do we need that? <laughs> Either or marketing. Who cares about that? Who cares? But yeah. I think it's you know one of the things we are focusing on our platform is role diversity. And so that's why we've gone and we've created these three advisory groups. We have a community advisory group, which is kind of like a lot of the, um, it's basic behavior and the spirit of mentorship throughout the entire community. But it's also like representing all the different nonprofits that are coming forward. So like we have a really active um, education group, for example, because different universities and researchers and even K through 12 teachers are coming forward saying, hey, we wanna work on this. And eventually some of us, our stuff, we do wanna make standards. And then we have the marketing advisory group, which is a little bit of a misnomer, but I really wanted to call it MAG. Um, and it's <laughs> marketing and evangelism and all that kind of stuff. So it really is, you know, taking all those use cases and bringing them in and helping with that and finding out where the markets are and doing all that work. And then we have the TAG, which is like on a, the technology advisory, the technical advisory group, which is more like on a meta level in regards to 
oh, what are the best practices in security? What are the best practices in architectural reviews and code reviews and things of that nature to help those other projects um, be higher, you know, production ready quality. Like when do we pay for a security audit for an open source project? When do we um, invest all of those additional resources into them? Things of that nature. And by going in there, and that's where you'll get a lot more architects and product managers and um, all of those types of people, it, it, you know, involved previously. And so for me, it's more about that diversity and understanding that the coders themselves maybe shouldn't be always the ones worrying about the standards. It's probably a lot of times a different person or above their pay grade. Um, but the corporations do care about that. You know, any of the different groups that they're working with do care. And if they're doing something for humanity and good, those nonprofits also care that way or, or the foundations funding them care. <laughs> exactly. So there, I think that there is something there, but I, I think that maybe we're oftentimes in open source putting way too much on the coders themselves mm -hmm. um, instead of diversifying the roles and making that community be a bigger, stronger community around that open source software. You know, advise. I, I love the, the notion of the broad Sloan of, of sort of advisory councils and bringing other people in. And I think that, you know, it's I lo love the fact that you have all those. And I think we need to do that a better job of that as foundations. I mean, I know, for example, at Oasis, we have our, our open projects advisory council, which if you look at our website, looks like a who's who of, of everybody that that we kind of we know in our in our group. And there's a reason for that. Right. It's it's an, it's intentional. And then also, you know, we've been trying to make sure that as we do our board elections and, and you know, I know Solano, you have a board as well. Uh, that's the thing is nonprofit. We have bosses. We have to answer to our board. Um, we've been trying to make sure that we have a good balance, right? And we have some, we have one of Dave's colleagues, uh, Rich Bowen from Red Hat and you know, Jeremy Allison from Google. We're trying to make sure that we get a representative balance on our boards because decisions that get made. Um, in these nonprofits, I think have to have a balance of open source and standards, you know, if you're going to go forward and, and actually do a good job with this. Yeah, we have a committee called the OSCOM, which is an open source committee. Um, and in fact, actually, Kat Allman and Hong just joined it. Nice. Asia. Uh, yeah, so we're, we've are we got like standards people and open source people. And they're the ones who handle what I call the IEEE governance versus the open source governance. They do influence the open source governance in regards to we'll be working on some templates for you know different size projects and things of that nature. But they're the ones who decide exactly what needs to be followed for something to become a standard. And so there's certain licenses that you must do. There's a certain amount of governance that you must do, you know, things of that nature. And they, they work on that and they kind of hold that piece for us. So and those meetings are open also and they're on the uh, calendar. So uh, anyone can attend and, you know, see what's up. So the, you both raised kind of an idea in there. The, the idea of advisories, I think, is really important. But one of the things that I remember from my experience in the IEEE and I and I I can't generalize it to other organizations, uh, but if you if you wanted to build an IEEE standard, you had a base document in mind, and you you and a few partners, you individual members of the IEEE, of course, would come forward and say, I want to build an IEEE standard. And at that point in history, thirty years ago. The IEEE would wrap an educational process around you. This is how you build a working group. And the intent of that, that kind of training, and it was you know kind of a long day as I recall, the intent of that training was to allow you to succeed when a whole, other, a whole load of other people wanted to show up and help you <laughs> that all had opinions on your base <laughs> document and your standard kind of thing. So you could get to a point of balloting and, and it was, that educational aspect and wrapping that around you before you ever had a working group meeting for your little standard that I thought was, at the time, I thought was a pain in the ass. At this <laughs> point in history, I realized was incredibly valuable at allowing the machine to actually continue to produce standards. And are you doing something similar with the open source aspects of, of your organization's work here as we step into this? Because, you know, we, we still see complete misunderstandings and, and, co and complete belief in the open source mythology to this day, you know, 20 years after the, the, the definition. Um, how, how do you help folks understand what it means? So we're doing a bunch of different things. And I have to admit, we are leaning on the community a lot in regards to that. But we are doing documentation and things of that nature. We haven't done any formalized training because I don't think we're there yet. Um, my big focus has been uh, recruiting for those advisory groups and getting um, 
this sounds bad, but the right people, basically people who are very experienced in open source, who are also friendly to creating best practices and going to, you know, and striving longer term in regards to that. Because one of the main things that we're trying to do on this platform is um, we're not just writing up documentation. We're also going in and doing templates and checklists, and then uh, we want to automate it and measure it um, so that we can iterate and create things that are better and more effective and have the data and the science behind them. So that's kind of our long path in regards to it. So we haven't done all of that yet, but I do plan on doing a fair amount of that. And that's one of the things I think that the educational group's been talking about a lot is um, that piece because there's a lot of people in there who are already teaching open source who are like, yes, we're teaching it, we're doing this. And then they're like, oh, but if we could have a tool that automated some of this, that would be awesome. Um, and so that's that's a lot of the stuff that's going on there. So we have a, the education subgroup under the community advisory group and they're kind of like, it's like their thing. You are such an engineer sometimes because <laughs> you, you, you walked your way down that path and, and, and I didn't realize I'd set the trap so perfectly. <laughs> oh gosh. Well, yeah. so I, I have recently had the experience of having to put together a course to teach open source practices. I was going to say, we've all done that, right? I, right. Just well, I, I, like, I, I, I have great confidence that we've all done it multiple times. Multiple times. And this, this was a brand new audience with a little more structure. This was an undergraduate course. Mm -hmm. And even coming out of that experience, which is only a couple of months old now, there was still this... I'm still basically teaching practices. And the thing that I, I realized I was I was still missing, certainly. And as I look ar across other people's courses, it's the same thing. None of this is about technology at the end of the day. We're, we're, yeah. we're coming up with agreements between people. <laughs> and whether it's you know useful artifacts in code or useful artifacts as specifications, and it's that how do you get the work done? And that's where I was so shocked at the kind of that back realization about the IEEE standards courseware kind of thing was it was teaching us how to get work done amongst a group of people. It wasn't so much about the rules. It was like, how do you actually come to consensus on something that I think was so valuable? And that's something that I, I, I worry that we're still missing. We're not describing it. You know, pe people still tend to look at this idea as, well, we can automate our way out of this. It's a long checklist. And as a, as an, as a technologist, I'll write the script kind of attitude, whereas it's not actually about the checklist. It's about working that checklist with other human beings. <laughs> yeah. It's the community aspect, right? It's it's the part of this that is the thing that you know, as as kind of an anomaly, an engineer who can talk to people. It's it's kind of how I've ended up making making my career at this point, right? I thought I was going to write code for my entire career, and kind of got halfway through my career and said, oh gosh, I'm not going to be the next Linus Torvald. So what do I do? Um, but being able to to have those skills in, is a difficult challenge. I, I agree, Stephen. And, and yes, I, I, I love all the stuff that Sloan has talked about on the platform and the checklists and the best practices. But at the end of the day, there is no substitute for really strong community shepherding, management, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the things that we're very fortunate with at Oasis that we've had both Jory Burson, who's now doing Open Open JS, and, and now Claudia Rausch, who just joined us, who's worked in KDE, to really be the people that kind of help not only do that community shepherding, but also grow other community shepherds and grow other community leaders um, in, in these spaces, Stephen, because you're right, finding a way to finding a way to do this, and I think more and more more importantly, replicate it, right? Because we we often joke that among those of us here and and, and the wider audience that there's probably, if we actually sat down and counted about 40 or 50 of us in the world that do this. Uh, and there's a lot more need than 40 or 50 of us, right? And so it's part of our job incumbent upon us to build these new leaders. And it's one of the things that I know I'm focused on, um, we're focused on at Oasis is figuring out not only how to automate it and make it a checklist, but how do we build this kind of this kind of practice in leaders. Yeah, that's one reason why it was so important to me to have the community advisory group is because I really wanted something to have that gravitas in regards to it. And one of the things that we do with some of those things is we kind of centralize certain things in the community advisory group. Like we have the badging program that we're working on and we expect to have lots of different kinds of badges all over the place. Marketing wants a badge for people, you know, um, the tag wants a badge for the projects themselves to go through and do production quality metrics and things of that nature. But 
it's centralized in the community advisory group so that they can actually sit there and guide it and make sure that it goes the correct directions. And there's a lot of overlap, like the tag went through and created some checklists, but then brought it over to um, the community group to sit there and discuss that. And similarly, you know, doing things like the team agreements for the advisory groups themselves, like they sat down and did that as a group and as a community to sit there and go, oh, you know, these are some of our basic premises that we're going to do as we operate with each other. And we think these are the good ways of going about doing it. Um, it was kind of funny because what happened is that first it's that one version got done in the technical and then the community went through and it added some more to it. And then by the time it went to marketing, they're like, OK, yeah, that looks good. <laughs> we're just going to adopt this because we like it. <laughs> but, yeah, that's that's one of the reasons we've been I, I did that, even though it in some ways it seems awkward to have a community advisory group. But at the same time, um, and, and it's hard to figure out how to place that correctly, you know, because right. it's, you know, it, and, and they were having problems with like self-definition. They're like, how do we show this and take this forward without, you know, being condescending in certain ways or things of that nature? And so it's, it's, it's been an interesting process because it's kind of new. Um, not very many open source groups have a, you know, like a, a what is it? A community steering committee. You know, many have a technical right. steering committee. Um, some of them even have a marketing steering committee, but very few have a community steering committee. So, and that's kind of what it's functioning like. But we don't sure. say committee. Challenge me where I live. Why don't you? You know. <laughs> <laughs> Just thinking about a piece of nonprofit work that I'm doing, and I was saying community advisory. Oh, there's an idea. <laughs> well. One of the things, one of those kind of flashpoints between code and spec that I saw a few years back um, started to rear its head was this idea of certifications. Hmm. And in the standards world, you know, certification's expensive. You're testing things, and testing requires, you know, dollars and staff. And and so to to have to get that good housekeeping stamp of approval on something typically isn't left to the the standards development organization. You know, they aren't funded to do that kind of work. Yeah. Uh, and it really is kind of a, a standard by standard, uh, depending on the, the kind of market around them, requirement. Do you, are you seeing those kinds of things happen in the open source world? Because that's that's a much more dangerous place to start talking about certification when you see folks that have never done certification say, oh yeah, you just use the code. Like what kinds of, are you seeing any of these issues show up yet? I've seen it in open source, in the open source hardware association, because that's definitely the oh, path, okay. there, yeah. um, which I think is really interesting and interesting to watch and trying to figure out because um, with IEEE, of course, we want to do open hardware as well as open data. And so we're trying to figure out, you know, how can we work better with them and how can we bring some of the stuff in? Because like working currently on the current GitLab or GitHub setup right now is like, ugh, you know, it's not great for them. And so we're like sitting there going, well, what would the tooling look like? How would we go in and support this better? How would all this look? And it's been interesting to watch them go more the path of certifications um, for that reason. And I think sometimes it has to do with sustainability uh, in regards to, you know, revenue streams. Um, but uh, yes, we are seeing some of that happen. And IEEE, we do do some certifications um, and we also do registries and things of that nature. So there has been some talk of that, but nothing really specific yet because I don't, I, I think we need to figure some stuff out first. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, on our side, we look at this as us enabling the community. So a great example is KMIP, right? The key management uh, protocol that is, it was developed here at Oasis. And we have an interop testing, right? Where that, that, that standards working group gets together and you know, basically does that that test fest, if you want to call it that, um, and figures out from there, you know, what issues they're having problems with making sure. And so, you know, do we do formal certification? I think our, our, we look at it as our job is to enable that community and get bring them together and have them figure it out. And KMIP's a great example of, of a community that's done that, so. Yeah, because they, the, the worst mistake I saw coming in from an, an open source centric organization that will remain nameless, um, was their attitude is, oh, we can certify products because you had to use the source code as is, as released. Right. And it was like, you really thought you were like, you're, you're not saying you have to maintain the interface. 
no, no, we had to maintain the exact source exact code, code within the yeah. release. And it was like, I'm pretty sure you don't want to do that. Because, <laughs> That's not you know, really interrupt. If, if I fix a bug, I'm no longer, you know, certified kind of thing. Right. And it's, or, you know, if there's any kind of changes to integrate it better into the overall product or anything, it was it was right. just a horrible idea. Right. Well, I mean, that, Steve, mm -hmm. you, that's what you sort of said is if, if you've got just one code base, it's a monoculture, right? So it's not like you can validate that these things, you know, interoperate correctly. And, you know, I, I look at, at places like medical, right? I mean, we, we've had this conversation. I know, Stephen, you and I have had this conversation. Sloan, you and I have had this conversation, right? And medical is a huge area where I think we need to make, we need to understand that there are going to be multiple vendors, there's going to be multiple things going on. And it's critical that things like, I don't know, you know, your, your healthcare device data is able to interoperate with, with other things that are, you know, used in the medical space. And it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, saying, oh, well, you only have to use our code is, it's just not viable for a lot of these, a lot of these industries. Right. Well, and it's the healthier thing being, an open source licensed project is a great component in a product. It's not the product. <laughs> right. Kind of thing. So. right. And we've had similar discussions about that in regards to testing frameworks, um, because certain standards are talking about, you know, citing the testing frameworks um, mm -hmm. for that. Uh, but I don't think right now it's been required yet. So um, because we're not doing that route but it has been useful. Um, but there has been a lot of discussions about versioning in regards to that because of the fact that you do have security fixes. You do have you know, all of these things coming in and tying that just directly to that piece is very dangerous. And to be quite honest, I think a lot of people won't go that direction for that reason um, because they do see it as being way too dangerous. And it is, I think, I think that was a frequently occurring topic on the uh, Open Forum Europe group that we were all in. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, and so it's like, yeah, uh, we are working on, you know, doing different pieces to try to make sure that we can have that kind of granularity in, in referenceability, um, like uh, the semantic versioning and um, God, I'm going to forget the, is it SDF? Simon's, ah, I'm forgetting the, the, it's the identifier thing. Um, I'll remember later. Yes, SPDX. thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Oh, SPDX. <laughs> Jamie's You're listening. It's great, great, to have, great to have my lawyer on the call. I always appreciate that. Thanks, Jamie. <sighs> I'm so bad at re It's so funny. All the standards in IEEE are all done by numbers and these little codes. And I saw and there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I know there's nothing wrong with it. It's very accurate and all of that. But oh my God, it sucks one for marketing. <laughs> And two, for me remembering it myself, and it's just not one of those. I I'm very visual, and they just kind of. It's okay. a standard to map those numbers to. Like you need the it's DNS. Okay. You need the exactly. DNS of those. That's what you need. It's okay. We we never unless you were in in the working group. We never talked about ten o three or ninety nine forty five. The ISO number. We always just said POSIX. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So but that's actually in a conversation in the marketing group is like, so how do we help these people come up with better names for themselves? <laughs> don't. Don't well, well, if they do want to become, if they do want a certain amount of search engine optimization and all that other kind of stuff to be findable and yada, 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 yeah, you're going to have to go that direction at some point. So we're going to well, just so look at that. I, I, I think what the one question I haven't asked, and I'll, I'll kind of roll it out there now just while... You guys are, are, are winding are, are comfortably in the mode. So uh -oh. <laughs> well, the, 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 the classic question I've seen over the last five years that folks have been trying to shove these things together has been, well, if you find a, a discrepancy between the open source implementation and the spec, which wins and the, and the, 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 that I, I want to narrow it because the only the only time that question really makes sense is you've published you know you've kind of said here's here's spec 1.1 and here's you know this this some you know semantic versioned piece of code that matches it and now you find a discrepancy how do you solve for that and it, it's I don't think there's a right answer yeah, as, or there is one, one right. There's answer. no, there's no one right answer for that. That's the issue. Yeah, 
because yeah. it, I, I've certainly seen the flip side when, it, and it was it was our very own Dave Neary who who made the observation that when you care about longevity, when the cost of change is high, you want a standard. And I one of the ugliest examples I ever saw of that in, in the POSIX world was not long after the original standard was was published, somebody found just a bug in the standard. There was a place where literally the, the length of the file name did and did not explicitly include the null terminating byte. And so that was the request for interpretation. And you have to remember the world was jamming together system five interface definition and the Berkeley code base. Oh. And the interpretation that came back for the specification was the standard says what the standard says. And you know, as 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 a much younger engineer, like that was a stupid answer. Yeah. But it does come back to that reality of the cost of change is high when you have this wealth of products in the marketplace that customers are depending on conforming to that spec. The idea that you're just going to go fix that is is a horrible idea. And at the same time, you know, it's almost like this, the fact that the, the specification is written in English gives you the wiggle room to do things like that. Whereas when it's written in code, not so much. Right. And you might, I think, oh, good. Go you no, know, I was just going to say, like, it, it's handling these problems going forward is going to be fabulous. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's, I think, one of the reasons why doing these things in consortia or, or neutral bodies is a really important thing, right? We've been talking, and I know I'm going to talk to your colleague, uh, Dave's colleague, Rich Bowen, uh, a little bit later, just on foundations and why foundations are important. And I think it's that neutral place to have that discussion. And you're right, that discussion is not always going to you know, you can't always say, well, we're going to do it this way. Or we're going to do it this way. Um, one of the things that we do and we like to think about is when we have a new project come in, right? We talk to the new project, um, you know, the, the stakeholders and, and the folks that are leading it. And, and it's kind of one of the questions we ask is, what do you what do you expect to be the way to solve this? And, and what's going to be the normative thing now? That's obviously, you know, doing that ahead of time is really valuable. Your question about how to fix it with a community that didn't do that, yeah, that's that's going to be, I think, the tough part. But I think it's incumbent upon us in the in the consortium world to to ask that question and to say, okay, how do you think that we're going to do this? Now, are we going to do that do it that way all the time? Maybe not. I think it's going to be on a case by case basis. But at least having that discussion a priori and having the communities sort of have an understanding of of okay, we think the spec is going to be the normative, you know source and we'll fix it in code uh, unless we can't fix it in code, right? I mean, I think it's just, because there's no right answer, I think the approach we take is to try to, to ask that question ahead of time and figure out what we think, what should be the, the normal path to do that. And then if there's not that normal path, then we have to do it as an on an exception basis. Right. Yeah, I think all the groups that are going this direction right now are very paranoid about that at the moment. And they are just kind of sitting there going, oh, how, if this happens, how are we going to handle it? And they're talking about that now um, because of the fact that, you know, they're the big experiments, right, right now. So they're kind of like, well, <laughs> um, so that that's, I think, how we're, I, I don't know exactly because I'm not as involved in the actual standards making portion as much as I am in the supporting of it. Um, so I would have to defer up the chain in regards to that. But um the way that I've, what I've seen so far is people are basically right now, especially they're so conscious and they're so aware that they're trying to figure out that ahead of time before they actually go into it. Right. And, and even stepping in, there was, there was work done. I think it's the, the Oasis IPR policy where you had to declare upfront, this is the rule that we're going to use. And anybody joining that, that working group, even if they stepped away from the working group at a later date, that commitment had been made. And so it's almost like a similar kind of idea where you're, the the individual working groups are going to have to have the choice, make it an explicit choice, and then you don't get to change it kind of naively, going back right. to Mr. Neary's point of when the cost of change is high, um, you know, you, you have to have that level of predictability in a marketplace. So <laughs> Jamie, Jamie points out a great thing is our experiments on making specs and reference implementations have been running for 20 years and we haven't killed anybody yet. So I think that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. 
<laughs> oh, and, yeah. and actually, I, I, Jamie's at least kibitzing from the sidelines. Do we have? I, I know we have some some fairly uh, experienced people uh, in the chat. Do, do we have questions from the audience out there? Yeah, this this has been a, have a question in the Q and A tool from uh, the aforementioned Jamie. This is uh, oh Dave again. again. Uh, so you made the point that some projects see getting help as being a pain in the butt. And um, the question that Jamie asks is, you know, how much well-meaning expert advice is a project required to take if they join an entity? And do too many lawyers um, do too many lawyers of coaching help become BDFL by committee? And I've seen this come up also in open source projects. I added a comment saying that, you know, this is not specific to SDOs that I've seen people wonder, for example, when they join the Eclipse Foundation or the Eclipse Project or, or even Apache, you know, how much agency do you keep over your project? And, you know, is, is the trade-off worth it? Oh my God, I can't, I, I wanna, I'm glad this is being recorded because now I have it on record that Jamie says there's such a thing as too many lawyers. Um, so but it's, it's, it was still a fabulous question. Though. It was a fabulous question. And, you know, it, uh, I think you have to be, you have to strike that balance, right? I mean, it, part of what, and I know Salona and I have talked about this and we agree on it, part of what makes working in foundations viable is that you have kind of just enough structure right? Just enough governance and it, that it doesn't become suffocating because yeah, at some point you're going to have cases where somebody needs to do something that's just slightly different and it can't, how much can you flex, right? And then, and then there's also for those, I know of us that have de jure relationships with ISO, ITU, et cetera, you can't flex too far, right? Because there has to be a line where you can say, okay, you know, yes, this is the governance process we followed. It was open, it was transparent, you know, and, and everybody had a chance to participate. So it, it's that, it's that tough balance of having just enough structure and governance to, you know, to, to guarantee the result, if you will, or to sort of certain, not ensure the result. Uh, and then, you know, not, 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 not so little that it's just loosey goosey. Salona, do you really agree with Guy? He claimed that you agreed with him. He just, made, he just kind of <laughs> like just locked her into a corner. No, I, I, she'll I, she'll I, kill I me for that later. Was, you know, it was a fine piece yeah. of rhetorical lock, but uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> well, it's, it's been interesting with, with my setup, right? Because um, it's not, everything isn't 100% open or switched completely over or things of that nature. So we have a lot of different weird things going on. Um, you know, so like, for example, if a standard comes in and they're still doing the whole IPR stuff that honestly is way out of my league and I don't understand it completely and all of that. Um, <clears throat> but then on this, on the open source side, everybody has to sign a CLA. And I know that that's a huge controversial decision that we've made, but that is because of the fact that we we're going way beyond the code. We're going into the ideas and concept space. And so that's what we have to do to be safe. Um, and so I think one thing that happens is when they come over to open source, they suddenly realize, oh, we're only allowing these licenses. Oh, we're having the CLAs. We're having all of this. So they already know that they're going to have to play a certain way um, for anything that they take out of that. They that they want to open source out of the standard. And so that I think that already creates a certain type of behavior um, mm -hmm. in regards to that. Uh, we do have a lot of discussions about which licenses we're going to do and accept. And in fact, right now we're having a we're about to start a call for discussion on a new CERN license um, for the open hardware component part. Um, and that's what OSCOM is handling and that's all going to be public and yada, yada, yada. Um, <clears throat> so we're doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think once, I think most people understand that like when you're using like Apache too, <laughs> you know, this is what it means. Um, and so it, when they do have some of that other pieces, it's like, that's probably not gonna be the open source part. That's probably going to be one of the other pieces that happens. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the, the whole CLA thing is is a big deal, and 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 I said something to Salona privately that you know, as a as a, a former individual contributor to open source stuff, I looked at CLAs and I'm like, oh, really? But it really is important to make sure that that you have that 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 part of the governance that that you know guarantees, like you said, Stephen, that somebody comes in and makes a, makes that commitment that you have it right, and that it's not. It, that it's not something that you have to go back on later and go, oh gosh, did we have the actual, you know, did we have the actual uh, commitment to do that or can we actually use that? Because then that becomes difficult to chase down later. 
Yeah, I mean, that, that is, I, I guess, the purpose of nonprofits, both in the standards development organizations as well as the open source based nonprofits, is to provide a certain amount of dependability and rigor that would allow a company, a commercial entity, to start to include those components in its products and services right. to customers. And yeah, uh, it, it's, I, I think all of the projects we could think of. Well, it, there was there was a great piece of work done by Henrik Ingo, ten years ago now at least, that he basically did the number crunch when the database was was smaller, on uh, the most active engaged projects out there, and he was looking at you know size and deployment and such, and the nine big groupings were all hubbed inside of nonprofits. And there was an order of magnitude step down to the 10th, which was hubbed inside of a, a commercial organization. And so it really was, there was that kind of, he, he was a good engineer, he was not cl claiming causation, but it was still kind of a stark r realization. And all of those organizations have some form of CLA in place so despite the fact that there's lots of anecdotal, oh, it gets in the way. Well, apparently not in the nine largest organizations 10 years ago. Um, and, it, and so it's, it's really providing that structure and rigor that allow the project to grow, that provide the dependability that a, that a standard, uh, people using the standard expect it to have. So I think the, the work that the two of you are doing is really important right now as you find your way through this space and evolve it so do we have other questions dave i have to admit i'm also kind of hoping stephen that uh by i triple e doing this with the sa open it will make certain companies less allergic absolutely in regards yeah. to it, uh because i think a lot of times it's easier for an individual to go to their company and say oh i need it to go work on this um, and it's got IEEE behind it than it is for something that maybe they haven't heard of before or an individual software project or something along those lines. It gives it a lot more gravitas. And so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of that for that reason. Um, and it's, you know, and I don't think what we do is overreaching. I think it's just all about, you know, making things as safe as we can for everyone. Right. And I mean, I think Absolutely. companies companies want this, right? Sorry, Stephen. Companies want this. I agree with you, uh, Salona. It's one of the things that came out of my discussion again with Chris Ferris is when I kind of asked a similar question, Stephen, to what you did is, why are organizations doing this? And he's like, look, it's a it's a it's a customer driven demand at this point that they want to feel like they there's that, that governance, there's that neutrality. And for things that are going to need to be around for, you know, longer than a couple of years, it's how do we get to the interoperability? And so doing the standards in this way, you know, kind of you know, hand to glove with the code is is a way I think for companies to feel a little bit more comfortable about adopting some of these things. Absolutely, I mean, it is. Each of your organizations represents a good good housekeeping seal of approval. I mean, it it, it was shocking for me when I first walked into this IEEE standards world so many decades ago that it was kind of like I was the only the, in in an organization that was kind of three hundred and fifty people meeting at that kind of frequency, which represented a big cost. There was only three of us that actually worked for use end user organizations. And that was kind of bewildering at first until you realize that, okay, so the three organizations were all fairly technical and fairly demanding in their use. So we represented at least interesting voices of the customer in those rooms that were otherwise vendors. Right. But it was still the rigor that and the imprimatur of we we were working on an IEEE standard kind of thing. And and so I think all of the nonprofits in both the open source space as well as the the, the SDOs uh, kind of provide that basis of trust right. so that a customer the customer doesn't care what the nuts and bolts look like. They just care that there was a standard on it or that it was it came out of a, a neutral open source body kind of thing. So yeah. Do we have other questions out there, Dave? We do not have any more questions in the Q&A tool. I am curious to ask all Please. of our panelists, um, what kind of things have you done to help your members and their, you know, the, the people who are participating in open source who are traditionally standards people? What kind of programs and, and uh, um, I guess, support exists 
in uh, your organizations to to help them kind of overcome the the culture clash um, to get over that. You know, there is a, there is a hump in terms of uh, you know a learning curve in in terms of changing from standards development to open source. And I'm curious, you know, how successful you've been with that, and whether there are links that you can point people to in the chat and that kind of thing. Right now, I think we're doing a lot of hand holding. Um, all of the different, the 16 different ones that came over were very well supported by Joshua Gay. And Josh, as y'all probably, many of y'all know him, you know, he's done a lot with licenses. He's done a lot with standards. He's done a lot of different things in regards to this. Um, and so he, he, he sure put them through, you know, to be quite honest. Uh, and then what we're doing right now is, you know, we're working with the OSCOM and then also the um, IEEE governance leadership, it's called the incubation SMDC. And um, the cool thing about that is the majority of people, they were already into open source. And so um, one of the things that happens with this getting launched is basically you find all the people in IEEE standards who want to do open source and they're all just like rah, 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 which is super helpful because you know so much wouldn't get done without those wonderful volunteers. I mean, it just wouldn't. Um, and so right now I'm kind of spoiled in that the majority of the people that are getting super involved in this from the IEEE realm are already into open source. And so I haven't had to deal with a huge amount of the culture shock, um, though I have dealt with some of it from, as uh, Jamie says, the attorney side. <laughs> um, and that's been a little bit more of a, but again, it's, it's the number of it is as such that they typically get a certain amount of handholding. Um, in regards to that, but we do things like we have the open office hours, we have the chat, um, we're working on a bunch of educational materials on the platform themselves. They can attend the advisory groups. We had a workshop in December. You know, we're doing all those other different kinds of things. Do we have anything solidified yet in regards to transitioning? No, I wouldn't say that we do have anything that's that formal, but we have been doing a lot of different things in process that we wanted to do for our community in general. And so, you know, we bring that in for them. Yeah, I, I, same, right? I mean, I think we're at a point in the evolution where having that, you know, having it sort of codified in a in a do this, this, and this uh, is not there yet, right? So similar to your situation, Sloan. And I think that some of that is kind of back to Stephen's point is some of that you can say, hey, here's how you do it. And some of it, you just have to kind of work them through or, or handhold them through. I think what's interesting from, from my perspective is I see, because I kind of had this perspective uh, uh, when you brought this up, Dave, of, of, oh gosh, standards people don't know how to collaborate. As Stephen has pointed out, that is so far from the truth. Now they collaborate in a different way on a different pace with a slightly different culture. And so figuring out how to map that for them as to, hey, this is what happens in open source. And, you know, it's going to be a lot quicker than you're used to. And, and here's why. And, you know, here are, the, here are the kind of places I like to call them. Here, here are the checkpoints where, you know, the standards people can talk to the open source people and they're at a similar point of, oh, okay, here's what we're doing, right? Kind of mapping those checkpoints, if you will, where they can come together and have those conversations, I think is a really, really important thing. Um, and some of that, yeah, may, you may be able to do training on and you may be able to kind of get checklists or templates. But at the end of the day, I, I think it's that some of it is going to be that human to human thing. And I, I understand already those out there saying, well, that's not going to scale. Yeah. I mean, it's an issue, right? It's it's one of those things, again, where I talk about growing these community leaders and growing, growing the folks in the two communities who can I think our goal, my goal is for the, those two communities to find people who have just enough interest and, and, and ability to talk to the other side that you can sort of grow those people that can that can stand between between that gap. That's totally. fabulous. So I think we're at time. I want to thank the two of you for your time today. I mean, this has been fabulous. I think the work that you're doing, like I said, is genuinely important as you kind of expand this space and figure out what those conversations have to be. So I want to thank you both uh, for your time today. And Dave, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you Stephen. Thank you very much, Stephen, for organizing this, uh, for hosting. Uh, thank you very much, Salona and Guy, for joining us today. It's been a fascinating conversation. I've loved the chatter on the side as well. Uh, next week, I'll be joined by uh, Dries uh, Boitart and Heather Rocker from the Drupal Project. Uh, Heather is the executive director of the Drupal Association, and Dries is the, the founder and, and the creator of, of Drupal. And uh, we're going to talk about um, 
how Drupal has succeeded in creating a, a, a commercial ecosystem around the project that basically started in somebody's dorm, dorm room. Um, and it's I think they've done a really good job of balancing the creation of that commercial ecosystem with the maintenance of a, you know, a vibrant community developed project. And um, so I'm, I'm interested in exploring that with them. So I hope to see you all here. And uh, again, Stephen, Salona, Guy, thank you very much for the, for the fascinating conversation today. Always good to talk. Sorry we can't do it in person. Miss you guys. No, Take I miss care. You.